Josh Hoover will miss spring practice with an undisclosed injury. How big of a deal is it that the Horn Frog signal caller will not be available for those reps? Also, TCU basketball, the men, they are headed to the NCAA tournament. They will take on Utah State in round one. All that and more coming up next here on Locked On Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. We're free and available wherever it is you get your podcast. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. I would encourage you to do that. Also, your favorite podcast platform. Fully intended to talk some basketball at the start of the show today. I will do that in segment two. If you want to hear more about the matchup with Utah State, the Aggies, TCU, the nine seed, Utah State, the eight seed winner, will presumably get Purdue uh, in the Midwest region, the one seed there. But breaking football news took priority today because I think this is pretty significant and I want to talk about it off the top of the show. Uh, Steven Johnson had this report. He was the first one. But as I'll have the news on Twitter, Josh Hoover will miss spring practice due to injury. TCU expects him to be fully cleared for summer workouts per school spokesman. Jamie Plunkett and Jeremy Clark also confirmed this. The guys from Horn Frog Blitz, they also confirmed the report. Plunkett uh, said that Hoover had to have surgery, and so that's why he's missing spring practice. Spring practice starts on March 23rd, so it's coming up this weekend. And this is fascinating. Now, Undisclosed injury. Don't exactly know what the issue is. The fact that they're saying they think he'll be available for summer workouts makes me think it's not too serious. But obviously, priority number one, your quarterback has to be healthy going into the season. I feel like people hear this news and there's two general questions they have. One is, how big of a deal is this? And then number two, uh, does this open the door for a QB competition with Ken Seals, the transfer from Vandy, being presumably the number two guy going into spring camp, and then Haas Haney, the true freshman from Alito, coming in and rolling early and taking uh, part in spring camp as well. First off, how big of a deal is this? Uh, This is a pretty big deal to me. I don't feel like you have to hit the panic button. It's not going to sink the season. But I will say, I I think TCU's going to be better this year. One reason I had a lot of optimism especially for the offense, because the offense was not good last year. And I know there's some metrics that you can look at, like total offense, yardage, yards per game. Okay. Offense wasn't good. It wasn't efficient last season. They didn't score in the red zone. They struggled in short yards. They struggled with the chains at times. They have to be more consistent this year. Defense was also really bad. When when you're five and seven, usually it's all three phases. And in 2023, it was. But I think at times the offense kind of got left off the hook because the defense played so poorly. Offense has to get better this year if this team's going to take a step forward. I thought they could do that, one, because they reworked this offensive line. They, they're bringing in a lot of transfers, and I think continuity is going to be a big deal. But I feel like there's more talent on this O-line. There's more experience on this O-line this year, which should be beneficial to the team. Another reason is Josh Hoover, I still think he's the guy. But I was under the impression before this news came down that he would get the majority of the reps as QB1 in spring practice and in the fall as well. And that would be great for the team because it would give him more opportunities to gel with his receiving core. I think one underrated things last season that this team really missed out on. There wasn't a ton of chemistry between Chandler Morris and these receivers, and then Hoover had to come in in the middle of the season, and so that kind of threw a wrench in things as well. And Sonny alluded to this a few times last year, his frustration with the fact that, I mean, nobody's fault, but receivers missed a lot of practice time. Whether it was because of injuries or some off-the-field reasons, they just they rarely had the same four or five guys going through the practice reps week after week. And when that's the case, it's tough to develop communication, chemistry, all those things you need between a quarterback and a wide receiving core. 
I thought it got better towards the end of the year. Josh Huber seemed to kind of find his guy with Savion Williams, but it took nine or ten weeks until it felt like they were sort of in a groove. And I was hopeful that would be more locked in going into the season, and maybe it will be. Bottom line is you just you can't get these practice reps back. And I believe in Josh. I think he's talented. I think he can do the job. He's not a four-year starter or a two-year starter even that's coming back under the same offense and doesn't necessarily need all the practice reps. Like this is a guy that played six games last year. And I thought he did an admirable job as a backup QB being thrust into a tough situation. But I was really hopeful for how he could grow and learn this offseason. And if I, if Josh is who I think he is, which it seems like the team really rallies around him, I was, I was impressed with how he handled himself as a leader last year. I believe he's going to be super engaged through this rehab process. He's going to be with the team. He'll be taking as many mental reps as possible, right? Um, he knows the offense well. So that part of it you don't have to worry about. But there's still just the the physical aspect of going out and making the throws, going through your progressions and playing the game against a live and real defense that you'll be missing out on now. The second part of this, I still don't really believe there's going to be a quarterback competition. But I do think his absence opens up a small window for Ken Seals or Haas Haney to at least make this a more competitive situation going into the fall. If one of those guys is super impressive and turns heads, then yeah, maybe there's, there's more of a, okay, let's just, let's see what they got. But I really feel like this is Josh's job and it's, it's, it's the reason why it's unfortunate that he's not getting this opportunity to work with the team in spring practice. You know, a few years ago, again, totally not his fault, but Max Duggan um, had a heart issue and it was a scary deal. Like they found it during the COVID testing process. He had to go through a procedure. Didn't know if he was going to play football again. Thankfully everything worked out and he got to play, but he missed a lot of practice because of that. And spring practice got, shut down that year because of COVID. I think TC maybe made it through one or two spring practices before the whole world shut down. Um, and, I mean, you could tell in that COVID-shortened season that for all the guys, but I think especially for Max, it was a struggle because he missed a lot of time. And it took him a while to really settle in and get to a place where he was playing good football, which he was towards the end of the year. They were also playing – some subpar competitions towards the end of the season, but they finished the season strong. It took five or six weeks, though, for him to really find his footing again. Now, I don't think this is the same situation with Josh because it sounds like he's going to go through the summer, go through the fall. And last season, you know, Coach Dyke said that Josh uh, was really um, – what am I looking for? He took initiative in getting the receivers together – you know, even when there wasn't organized practice time, getting the guys together in the summer and early in the fall before camp started, hey, let's get together and throw. Like, let's go through the route tree. Let's start learning this terminology of the new offense. Let's get these, you know, reps in even outside of normal practice time. And that's great. And I think he'll do that. I feel like he'll definitely um, do as much as he can to try to make up for some of the time he missed this is just time that you can't really get back. And so, you know, it's, it's significant. I don't know what it means big picture. I really don't think it changes a lot as far as the quarterback competition goes or lack thereof. But I do hate that he's not going to get this opportunity to just start building rapport with the team again. Um, and you got a lot – I mean, part of this too is you got a lot of new faces. As in the world of transfer portal, it's kind of always going to be this way. But you're shuffling things around the offensive line. You got Eric McAllister at one of your wide receiver positions. I think he's going to be one of the main guys catching the football. So just a bummer that Josh is not going to be 
on the field. But I think he'll handle this well. Um, and good news is, at least as of now, it sounds like this is a pretty simple thing that they can get fixed, and he'll be ready to rock and roll in the summer and into the fall. Um, just unfortunate that he's not going to be part of spring practice. So Josh Hoover, missing spring practice. I'd love to hear your reaction. On the YouTube comments, you can tweet at me, at some guy, Steven. The show is at Locked On TCU. Scale of 1 to 10, or kind of parse out whatever you want there, but how significant is it that Josh Hoover will not be around for spring practice for TCU this offseason as uh, he's dealing with an injury and they think that he'll be available for spring practice. When we come back, they made it in. TCU basketball, they were on the bubble, but Jamie Dixon's squad makes it to the tournament for a third straight season, and they take on Utah State, the Aggies. So we'll break down uh, who Utah State has available, who they are next here on Lockdown Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. Nissan passion drive. It's what makes Nissan one of the great uh, car dealers in the country. It's March Madness. They have bracket highlights every week brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Um, and they're describing their new SUVs, the 2024 SUVs, the Nissan Armada, the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder. They're all available. The Yukon Huskies can only be described as an Armada. The top seeded team is a hardcore uh, group. It's no wonder they've landed as the top overall seed in the NCAA tournament. They're one of the favorites to win it all, despite four of the six uh, Power Six Conference champions standing in their way in the East region. The 2024 Pathfinder, Rogue, and Armada all available now. Take the Nissan Rogue Pathfinder or Armada and go on your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Again, that's shop NissanUSA.com. And check out their great line of 2024 SUVs. If you are looking for a new television before the madness starts on Thursday, how are you going to watch it? Why not try out the Amazon Fire TV? Fire TV is your destination for sports, live games, highlights, in-depth analysis, and more. They have great viewing experiences. Um, and there's also the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free live television. The Fire TV has everything you need. Uh, Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels, deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes the Locked On Network and most big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Um, check out Fire TV channels and Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, go to www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. Again, that's amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. TCU basketball, Friday night at 8.55 Central Time. This is like the third straight year, and I was hopeful that it would be different this year because they're in the Midwest region the last few years. It seems like they've been sent out west. But the, the late night Friday night game, I mean Friday at 9 o'clock, Remember a couple of years ago, they played Seton Hall in that time frame. I can't remember what the matchup was for Arizona State TCU. I know it was another night game. But, uh, yeah, anyway, just a, a funny coincidence. But TCU basketball, they're headed to the NCAA tournament for a third straight season. For the first time ever in program history, I do want to take a second to say, I totally understand the frustration with uh, Jamie Dixon and just kind of hanging around 500 in the conference and being on the bubble come tournament time. But I do think it's important to acknowledge making an NCAA tournament three years in a row is not something that seemed possible a decade ago, right? Um, he's done an outstanding job getting this program from where it was to a place where it's respectable and where we can expect appearances in the round of 64. And they've you know won their first round game the last two years. We'll see what happens this season. The opponent this year, the Utah State Aggies, um, Utah State had a really good year under first-year head coach Danny Sprinkle, who came over from Montana State. Now, the interesting thing about Utah State, they did not play a Power 5 team all season long, not in their non-conference, not in the conference schedule. But 
they are part of the Mountain West. The Mountain West was loaded this year. They got six tournament teams. San Diego State went to um, the NCAA championship game last season. Um, Boise State had a really good year. The, the Mountain West was a legit conference. They finished 27-6, and 14-4 and four in conference play, and they won the Mountain West regular season title, um, ended up falling in the Mountain West tournament, in the Mountain West championship game to San Diego State, but um, had a really great regular season, ran through the conference for the most part. So I reached out to my buddy Jake Hatch because Jake covers uh, – well, I've had him on the show before. He covers the BYU Cougars. That's a locked on uh, – Cougars podcast. And he also covers Utah State because he's right there in the area. And so here's what he told me, kind of a brief kind of Cliff Notes version of Utah State. Um, they returned zero points and zero rebounds from last year. Incredible season for Danny Sprinkle as a first-year head coach there. Get to know Grant Obizor, 6'8", 250-pound bulldozer of a forward. Um, he's a double-double machine. Darius Brown uh, is also a name to know. He thinks it'll be a good game. So great Obizor, um, who is from England, uh, and he grew up in Spain, played his, his high school basketball in England, gets picked up by Montana State, goes and has some good seasons there, and then ends up at Utah State this season. And Jake's right. I mean, he is a double-double machine. 18 points and uh, nine rebounds this season. So he's been getting it done. And I was watching some highlights of great today as I was trying to get to know him as a player because that size is impressive. It's not really – I mean, 6'8 is a good frame, but 6'8, 250, um, just physically he looks the part. And he's kind of an old-school player. I mean, he can step outside and hit some mid-range jump shots, but he really lives, like, down low. And they do a good job of having him – you know, set screens at the top of the key and then roll out, or they'll set screens from him to pop out of the free throw line and catch a pass. Um, he hunts mismatches well. He finds smaller guys on him and immediately posts up and gets big and looks for the basketball. And he's physical at finishing. Like, contact doesn't bother him because, again, he's got that great size and that great frame. He understands angles. He understands where to go up with the basketball. So that's going to be tough. Now, Ernest Uday – physically should match up with great pretty well, but you always worry about Ernest being in foul trouble. Um, they'll throw Xavier Cork at him too, um, but he is their big-time scorer. Again, also big-time rebounder, can pass the ball fairly well, and is going to do a lot of his his action down low. Um, Darius Brown had a really good season for them, the point guard, 12 points a game, 39% from three. Um, Ian Martinez, 37% from three for the season. So they can shoot the three ball a little bit, uh, but they're at their best really working inside the paint in the mid-range game. They're pretty efficient scoring from, uh, you know, inside the arc, and they like to slow it down, and they like to play at a, a, a pretty slow place and make it a half-court game. So I think one huge key to this is going to be can TCU get up and down the floor in transition, especially early in this contest, because Utah State is not going to force the issue that way. They want to get in their half court sets. They want to let you know their team run their offense and do it well. Um, and and so, who can sort of impose their will early in this game, especially? I worry about TCU if it does become a possession by possession contest. Who's going to take over? Can they get good shots? Can they get good looks? And can they score? Now, Jamie Dixon said in his press conference after the selection show, that he really liked the effort defensively in the tournament. He thought they made some strides there. They got to get better, but he, he feels like they're moving in the right direction. And I will say, as bad as that Houston game was, and a few of you commented on the video that I dropped on Friday, um, I get it. It was, it was bad. They scored 45 points. It's unacceptable. Now, I mean, Houston is outside of UConn, number one team in the country, number two team in the country behind UConn. They're number one seed, great team. But still, I understand the frustration. The offense was atrocious. I did think their effort was pretty good that night, though. I thought, you know, they, they crashed the boards well. They were really good on the offensive glass. Um, they found ways to be active. And I thought they played pretty good defense, too. I mean, Houston hit some shots, but they still only scored 60 points. It wasn't like they just had an offensive explosion of a night either. If it becomes a possession-by-possession possession game, though, I just, I'm just i concerned about CCU's ability 
to hang there. Um, Utah State has I, – I, I struggle to think, though, that Utah State has seen athletes like this. It's really about can TCU control it and can they make things happen. For what it's worth, Frogs are uh, three-and-a-half-point favorites on FanDuel. Um, Jay Bill has picked Utah State to win the ball game. I haven't really seen a lot of experts. I didn't spend a ton of time looking around today at this matchup. If the Frogs win, they'll most likely take on Purdue on Sunday. Um, and Zach Heady is most likely to be player of the year this season, 24 points and 11 boards this year. They've got some shooters around him that will make you pay if you try to double and triple team him and force him to pass the basketball. Tall task. But first things first, you got to take care of uh, Utah State and what should be a good matchup on Friday night. So excited for this team to get that challenge, though, and get in the postseason again. Uh, when we come back, TCU baseball, woof, big woof, got swept by Oklahoma. We'll break that down next year in lockdown. Horn Frogs, your team every day. All right, FanDuel, fanduel.com slash locked on. Still got great deals going on. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, you put one $5 bet down, you win that bet, $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, and even more. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Official betting partner of the NBA, the NFL, and bringing you all sorts of opportunities um, in the NCAA tournament. FanDuel, proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. TCU baseball is 1-5 in, in conference play. They're 15-5 and five on the season. They're 1-5 in, in conference play. They got swept by Oklahoma at Lupton um, over the weekend. They have a worse Big 12 record than the Baylor Bears, and I think that should tell you everything you need to know about the baseball team at the moment. Now, I've, I've been watching people, and I said last week they lost two out of three to Kansas. They had to have a, a big-time comeback on Sunday to win that ball game. Things didn't go well in Lawrence. I said, listen, I think Kirk Sarloos has earned the benefit of the doubt. This program's earned the benefit of the doubt. More times than not, they turn things around, they get it done. I am starting to get more concerned. Now, I get it. Last season, they were 23 and 20. They were under 500 in conference play. They had an ugly series against Texas. They got swept by West Virginia the week before that, I believe. Um, and then they just went on an absolute heater to end the season. And so I, I've seen people point to that as to reasons for optimism. Baseball's a long season. I understand all those things. I get all the caveats. I know that you can't freak out based on small sample sizes, right? Um, I'll my my issue is this. Last year's team was totally different than this year's for the most part. I mean, there's some returning pieces, but the core of this group is very different. The things that are giving me the biggest concerns right now. The pitching hasn't been good really all year long. I mean, they, they started out 13-0. and 0, and They swept UCLA, which was impressive at the time. They swept Florida Gulf Coast. Had to have a couple comebacks in that series. Um, you know, survived those games at Globe Life Field. Blew a lead against USC, but got it back. But specifically, the starting pitching has not really been good all year long. Um, there's... They're either not going deep in games or they're giving up too many runs. This weekend, Peyton Tole, best start of his, you know, time at TCU. was really solid. Bullpen ends up coming in, blowing it. Um, Cole Klecker, kind of the same story he's been following all year long. Gets a great start, four innings. Things are going smoothly. Runs into issues in the fifth. You know, defense had some issues, but still gives up, hangs at like a five spot in the fifth and gives up the lead. On Sunday, Braden Sloan implodes early in the game. TCU can't come back and win it. And, I mean, I think it seems like Tolle is maybe hitting a stride a little bit. I want to I want to believe in Cole Klecker. I mean, he did it last season, but it's been a struggle this year. Braden Sloan um, has not been good since getting inserted in the starting lineup a few uh, weeks ago. And so I don't know how you fix the rotation. I know Luis Rodriguez, his name was bantied about some this weekend, and I get that. Luis pitched well this week, 
but he also pitched a lot this past week, so I'm not sure if he'll be ready to make a start on Sunday. Um, they go to Stillwater to play Oklahoma State, another tough series. This team is one or two series away from, I mean, you can climb out of it and try to make the tournament, but really a lot of your aspirations about finishing the top half of the Big 12 would kind of be kaput. So the urgency has to be there. you got to start winning some games, putting a streak together, and getting it done. And the thing that's been most consistent this year has been the bats, and those have gone silent lately. So I want to believe – but I'm starting to get more and more concerned about where this team is. They play UTA at 6 o'clock tonight and then a series in Stillwater against Oklahoma State this weekend. We'll have plenty of coverage of that as well as basketball and football as Lockdown Horn Frogs continues on this week. It's your team every day.